Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms, and today we're going to be doing a review of the MFJ 845 HF Digital SWR Watt Meter. The specifications of this particular piece of equipment, 0 to 200 watts between 1.6 and 60 megahertz. Cost of this meter is $140 or $139.95 from the manufacturer. This meter measures both forward and reflected power and also SWR, standing wave ratio. For those of you who do not know, standing wave ratio is a common measurement used to display the match of an antenna or how well an antenna is matched to a transmitter. That in and of itself doesn't indicate that the antenna is an effective radiator, but it does show that the transmitter is going to deliver full power into the antenna and that is indicated by the relationship between forward and reflected power. Meter itself weighs 9 ounces on my scale so it's relatively heavy. It's made of metal construction. It has two SO239 connectors. On the back side of it you see some instructions and there's a battery compartment down here that's accessed with a Phillips screw that contains two AAA batteries. Removing our Phillips screw and our cover here you can see the cells installed inside the piece of equipment and there's also a, another source of powering it which is a micro USB plug in the side of it. Now it's important to remember this doesn't provide any charging functionality, merely power for the device. So if you do put rechargeable cells in here, understand that you're not going to be able to recharge them through that micro USB plug. In my testing I found the battery life to be Okay, uh, I'm not going to say it's been the best because it does have a backlight, which we will see here in a second when I turn it on. The light does consume a considerable amount of power, so if you don't need the light, leave it off. The light itself will extinguish itself after 30 seconds, even though the switch is in the on position, but when you transmit, it'll illuminate on its own. Our display here shows your forward power on top your reflected power here on the bottom and then to the right on the bottom your SWR. Now when I originally purchased this piece of equipment I felt like the form factor of it would be a little bit smaller. Now this thing isn't huge, I mean at 9 ounces it's, it's pretty doggone heavy, but I felt like something in this configuration would be more durable in moving it around and keeping it in a, a bag or something of that nature. Uh, I thought it would be more along the lines of the size of this right here, which I've had this for about 25 years. Now this is just a VHF and UHF meter, and you've seen me use this in videos before. And like I said, this meter has given me excellent service over that period of time. But I thought that it would be small like this particular piece of equipment here, but that was not the case. It is a little bit larger in order to accommodate the batteries, etc., and the display. To make sure that everything is consistent, we're going to utilize the uh, same load and the same cabling for the test. Now, the cable we're going to use, we're going to end up having to put a type in on it when we're doing our initial testing because that's what interfaces with the service monitor and I don't want to use adapters. And we will utilize that to measure the power output of our various test transmitters. Then we will change that to a PL259 for testing our meter. Our test transmitters that we're going to be utilizing are my FT817 and my VX1700. We're going to use the FT817 for testing below 5 watts, and then we're going to use the VX1700 for testing at the 10, 50, and 100 watt range. We'll be doing our testing in the 40 meter band, or 7 megahertz range, and we will be utilizing CW because we need a switch continuous carrier mode to perform effective testing. We'll start with the FT817 at low power. Next our VX1700 at low power. Now our VX1700 at medium power. And now our VX1700 at high power. Now we're going to compare our results with what we saw on the service monitor. We're going to start with 5 watts.
And now we're going to test our 10, 50, and 100 watt range, starting with 10 watts. Moving to 50. And now to 100 watts. Now that we've completed the Ford power testing of this piece of equipment, we're going to go ahead and see what is displayed in SWR on a known mismatch. The reference piece of test equipment we're going to use to measure the mismatch load is my rig expert AA30. To demonstrate the accuracy of it, we're going to use this known mismatch load, which should display a 1.5 to 1 on my AA30 at the frequency of interest. One important thing to understand is, is that if you do have a mismatch load termination such as this, that these, something of this size isn't meant to have RF sent into it. Uh, this one's rated for like 3 watts, so for a low output piece of test equipment such as this, it's just fine. But when you start to push like 5 watts of RF into that, it starts to act a little strange and it heats up quickly and you'll destroy that mismatch load and those things are not inexpensive. So we'll go ahead and turn it on. And we'll go ahead and measure our SWR at the frequency of interest. And it's 1.5 to 1. So we know this piece of equipment is accurate. And now hooking this up to our mismatch load we're going to use for testing, you can see that is an SWR of 2.6 to 1. We know from our analyzer that our known mismatch was 2.6 to 1. Let's send some RF through the meter into our load and see what it says. So it's saying 3.35 and you can see we got 7 watts forward and 2 watts reflected. And as before let's compare our device under tests results with our cross needle meter and we can see that we're looking at about 2.7, 2.8 to 1 and looks like 7 to 8 watts forward. Using a meter such as this in conjunction with a manual antenna tuner would be a quite common task. So let's try that out right now and see how that's going to work with this particular meter. So we'll go ahead and send RF. And we can see that our reflected power is considerable. And as we make adjustments to our tuning capacitors you can watch the reflected power decrease and our tuner start to do its magic and for comparison's sake we'll check it against our cross needle meter and you can see that it's right on the money we're going to check for insertion loss anytime you insert anything into a feed line you're going to cause some loss. Loss typically at HF frequencies is not great. As the frequency increases, losses increase for inserting objects in the feed lines such as our meter under test. So right now we have a signal generator that's generating a signal of minus 40 decibel milliwatts. It's actually a little bit over that. It's been, we're regulating for the loss of all the cabling and adapters at a frequency of 30 megahertz. So we're going to go ahead and insert our meter in here. So inserting our device in line it's easy to see that we're looking at perhaps a tenth of a dB of loss at 30 megahertz. So what do I think about the MFJ845? I like it. I think it's a good idea. I like the size of it and its utility. If I had to rate it between one and five stars I'd give it 3.5 stars and I'll explain why. The pros of this meter are again its size and form factor. I mean this is the perfect candidate to be thrown in a, a sock and thrown into someone's antenna bag because it's durable enough to take a beating and keep on working from what I can tell because of the metal construction of it and because there's not a fragile meter movement to get jostled around. So that is all good stuff. It's a broad range meter. It covers everything from 160 meters up through 6 meters or 1.6 to 60 megahertz. 
and it covers a power range of 0 to 200 watts, which good for that. And it's extremely simple to use. I mean, all you do is, is you take this thing and you plug it in line, you flip the switch on, and basically there's nothing to it. You don't have to take a, another switch and select a range for it to operate in or to calibrate the meter like you would with like a legacy SWR meter. Okay, let's move on to the cons. The first con is going to be the cost. It's $140, again, for this particular piece of equipment, so it's not inexpensive. The second con is going to be its inaccuracy at low power. This thing's an ideal form factor for pairing it with a QRP type of radio, but the weight of it and the inaccuracy displayed at low power levels was, I mean, we were looking at, what, minus 28%. So... That's an awful lot. This meter would pair well with the conventional, you know, 100 watt HF radio. So if you're running 50, 100 watts of power, this right here would be a good choice. But for a QRP radio, I don't think so. The next is the battery. The uh, I'm not a big fan of using the AAA batteries. Yes, AAA batteries are available everywhere. However, the chances of leaving alkaline AAA batteries in this and then them corroding is uh, greater than normal. It would be very easy to incorporate some kind of lithium ion solution in there and then have a charging port that actually charged the batteries on the side of it. I mean, you could use like an NP60 or something of that nature in there. There's it's not enough room in there for a CR123 already checked because I was going to change that up myself. But anyway, so some better battery solution. Uh, it could also be made more weather resistant, um, eliminating these slide switches and having buttons with rubber seals on the outside that would be nice and then seals around the perimeter of it. And selection of a better quality PL259 connector rather than the ones that are provided with. Certainly the ones that come with it are functional, but selecting a better quality component would make a better item. Well, I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comps. Till next time.